Tom has mentioned the books that he would recommend that you start with. I'll admit, I'd recommend that you buy them all. <laughs> it's my pleasure this evening to be part of this tribute band about an heroic artist. Having published his work for 36 years since The Sea in Winter in October 1979, and being his principal publisher for 30 years has been one of the privileges and excitements of my life. Yesterday, I made a list of what we've published in those years. Limited editions, full collected, plays, prose, translations. And the number of those publications surprised me. I think it would surprise any of you. I think it will surprise Derek. In fact, I'm prepared to invite you to count or to estimate the number, and I'll give a signed Derek Mahan book to whomever gets it right. <laughs> I'd say the author on Gallery's list with the next highest number of titles is Brian Friel. And there's something right and fitting about mentioning these artists together because they are, in my mind, the two writers we have who are most pure in the dedication of and the nurturing of their art. I love their work and I love them dearly. I remember a morning I was opening the mail and came to a new play script by Brian Friel, the play the home place, and then to a manuscript of poems that became Harbor Lights. And I remember also thinking, I like my job. <laughs> one of my favorite literary responses is the one by Brian Friel, following a question in the days when Brian Friel would be interviewed about his first really successful play, how, asked the interviewer, did you come up with the idea for Gar Public and Gar Private? I'm trusting you're familiar with the appearance in Philadelphia, Here I Come, of the two actors representing the inner thought and the outer expression of the principal character. How did you come up with that idea, said the interviewer. And Brian replied, Oh, that was simply necessary. And there's something of the same simple necessity of a rhyme in Derek Mahan's work, or an image, or a rhythm, or a line's or a stanza's length and shape. In his work, necessity is the brother of invention. His work coheres in stunning ways. Those of us who are familiar with Derek's working practice know that his poems appear eventually from a typewriter. Over 30 years, I've grown used to receiving his new work on typewritten sheets. Often they'd have a word or two, revisions, revisions, crossed out, and a chosen alternative written beside the line. Some while ago, he sent me some poems and in the margin were handwritten words that might be substituted for a typewritten one. But there was no crossing out. And I remember asking him when we spoke, Derek, did you mean that as a change? Did you mean to cross out a word? And he said, something that's always stayed with me. He said, I don't know. Help me, Peter. And in that admission of not knowing, I don't feel any lack or unsure-footedness in a writer whose work gleams with certain clarity. Instead, I find a courage, a self-awareness of not knowing everything. Better by far not knowing than knowing it all. But there is a word bound on knowing and knowledge that seems apt for the work and position of Derek Mahan in our culture, and that is 
conscience. From the early ironical observations, through the news bulletins of his poems in the Hudson Letter, and the stock taking as the century ended in the Yellow Book, and on through the abundant windfalls of those books Tom mentioned, Harbor Lights, Life on Earth, and An Autumn Wind, tracing the arc of a life from the northern dark to the southern light of Kinsale. He has assembled a body of poems that will be seen as measurements of our time. Now he attends to the housekeeping of collected volumes of poetry, of his work for the theater, of his translations, and how right it is that he is at home in world literature, and of his prose, and yes, his most recent book, Red Sails, might be his best prose, balancing perfectly what he reveals of his life and the revelations he returns from those places where a thought might grow. We discuss and plan further additions. In an age of overpraise and hyperbole, few artists deserve a tribute as much as Derek Mahan. He has earned it through his exemplary work, and that work will live forever. I've said this elsewhere, speaking of my part in it, as, as Alana said, his editor, his publisher, a sounding board sometimes, an agent often. For that part I play in it, I think of Mrs. Einstein, who once said it said, I just look after the little things. But let my last words be in fact his. Let me read one of his most recent poems, one which contemplates the 16th century moralist and essayist about whom Tom has just read, Monsieur Montaigne, whose work Derek encounters, as you heard first in 1964, at the Sorbonne. The poem's epigraph, Cassasia, is that huge existential question. What do I know? <clears throat> Montaigne. Since lately, I renounced administration to spend my time in idle speculation. I've been astonished by the fantasies an open mind can spin on its dark days. But a hoof clicks below and an autumn sun dazzles the live flow of the Dordogne. I can do nothing without gaiety, still there despite the death of Boethi. If one book bores me, I pick up another. Skimming and skipping, I would rather shit like a gent than trouble my digestion tackling a merely theoretic question. Some have withdrawn in hopes of a mystique, others in horror at the great mistake of this mad century, its religious hate. Knowing yourself, you know the human fate. What do I know? Only immediate things. I think and write as the bird sings. For mine, is a lazy, self-amusing style, not grim and purposeful as at Port Royal. A thought comes like a raindrop, a slow phrase like a cloud formation or a September breeze. I make nature my study as I grow old, unknowing to the last, in the known world. Great Derek Murphy. <laughs>